All right, so. Okay, we know what kilosort and kilosort 2 are. They're spike sorters. Um, they were originally motivated and mostly developed on this kind of data from these NeuroPixels probes that you have probably heard about. Um, there are these multi-channel, um, uh, right, so the first version of these probes, 384 channels, they're, they're densely packed. Um, it's basically the quantity of data is a little bit bigger than before. Uh, the quality is a little bit better. Uh, and this is not the only example of a, of a new probe that has massively increased the quantity of data. So it makes it you know, even more pressing that we should have a good, as automated as possible, spike sorted algorithms. Uh, because we're not going to go through every neuron that these probes record. Uh, one by one by eye and, and, and do cluster cutting, right, like we did in the 90s or something. Um, so the goal of, of, of Kilosort, of this workshop, maybe of future workshops, is to get us closer and closer to having you know, fully automated spike sorting. And let's see what, um, you know, why, oh, okay, right, that doesn't work, good. Um, Especially, you know, uh, you guys are gonna for sure get creative with these kinds of devices. Um, Nick Steinmetz in the lab had, you know, was one of the first people to, to, to try these out and test them and help with the development. And so, you know, he got real creative and put eight of these in the brain at the same time. Um, well, it was a technical challenge more, I guess, than a creative one. But um, the point is it's possible. You can get lots of neurons. Um, you can get data that looks like this. Here are the, the eight probes, probes in different colors, spikes from different neurons over the period of a second. And so the question is, how do we go from raw data um, to data where these spikes are not just detected, but also split into clusters according to their um, neuron that they come from? And of course, if you can do that, then uh, you can do all sorts of interesting analyses. So here's just one from one of our recent papers. Um, where you can see from top to bottom, these rasters are always of the same 3,000 or so neurons recorded from all sorts of different brain areas simultaneously. Um, and these kinds of data sets are, are rich. Um, they contain, for example, you can see all sorts of interesting you know, oscillations in different brain areas at the kind of different frequencies, you know, kind of higher here in retrospinal than in visual. Um, they, you know, different periods of, this is just a, uh, a mouse doing nothing, sitting there doing its, its own thing, moving a, a little wheel, uh, but otherwise in complete darkness, and it's undergoing different epochs of, uh, of different brain states, basically, uh, and then the, the patterns change. Um, so, you know, this is already just by eye, you can start seeing interesting patterns here, uh, even more so if you like sort the neurons, and we did this here according to some clustering algorithm so that similar neurons are next to each other. Um, so it would be really great if you could just focus on analyzing this data, right, and not so much on, on spike sorting and extracting it. So the more we can, uh, you know, because there's going to be like very, you know, there's all sorts of new issues analyzing high dimensional data to begin with, and we want to spend our time uh, working on those and, and thinking about those. Ah, yeah. All right. So here's one way to display raw data. It might, you may not have seen it this way before, but this is just an image uh, where I've sorted um, the channels according to their depth on this probe uh, as pixels, so rows in here. Um, and then you can see 100 milliseconds or so of activity. Um, and all these little lines are big negativities of the spike. So that's where we would detect spikes from these neurons. Um, and after we put data like this through kilosort, and this is actually directly from the GUI extracted, um, you get the reconstruction of the raw data uh, according to these little templates that correspond to basically the mean waveforms uh, of these neurons. And you know, you can, you can follow it, yeah, I mean, clearly now that I've kind of emphasized what the templates were, you can see which ones are kind of coming from the same neuron because they're repeating and they have the same pattern. But if you were to you know, look at them by eye here, uh, it would be very hard to you know, identify which ones were the same 
patterns repeating. And that's what we have the algorithm do, essentially. We're, we're having it uh, sift through this massive data to find co-occurrences of like similar shapes across channels uh, that might correspond to the same neuron. That's, that's the problem. It's a, it's a pattern detection problem. Uh, it's just that you don't know what the patterns are, and then you, you have to also detect them. So we have to learn both of those things at the same time. We have to learn the types of patterns we're looking for, and then we have to detect when they occur based on that information. So some of the, the place we started from, um, so QSR2 has been developed maybe over the past one, two years maybe now, um, mostly a year ago really. Uh, and we've known, we've known for a while what the main problem was that, that we were having in the spike sorting. Um, but a really nice way to emphasize that is to point out that you know, every spike sorting paper that you read where people do some simulations, and we did the same thing here, um, where you have a, a, a nice, um, nicely kind of stable recording in your simulation, um, you can show that the spike sorter can have really good performance. Like in this case, out of 74 units, uh, both Kilosort 1 and the Genelia, a spike sorting algorithm, GR Clust, um, you know, identified a pretty large fraction of these units. I mean, so large that, you know, if we got this many units um, for free without having to do any more manual work, we'd be very happy about it, right? If we, if you can get, you know, more than three quarters of the units, two thirds uh, of the units in this area, without any manual curation, that would be great because we've already, you know, we already know there are methods now to record lots and lots of channels. So if you want more neurons, you just you know, record more channels as long as something automated can give you this. But that's not the situation in practice. In practice, um, in practice what happens, right? So th this is where there's this discrepancy that we kind of, you know, we, we feel like we're building the right algorithms, but when you apply them to real data and you, know, you give them to someone to, uh, to look at, uh, some you know, experimentalist to use and, and try to investigate whether the sorting was good, they're gonna still find that there's lots and lots of problems. And so you know, slowly we began to like, really, um, really identify that most of the problem was due to drift, in, um, at least in the recordings that we had. And so, Drift is happening because your probe is moving up and down even a little bit with respect to the tissue, uh, or the tissue is moving a little bit up and down with respect to the probe. Um, actually, both of those could in principle happen, whether you have an acute recording or a chronic recording. Um, there are different advantages and disadvantages. Um, but one of the first kind of signatures you might have, regardless of what spike sorter you use, that you have some drifting units is that you use, look at their amplitudes over time uh, and you see that they're kind of you know, all over the place. They're, they're moving around. So even a, a cluster that you've nicely cut yourself, let's say, uh, or, or really carefully manually curated, uh, you'll still see a lot of this kind of amplitude change. And it has this kind of structured form where you know, these three units are from the same recording the only thing that's different between them, so they're, they're, they're exposed to the same drift patterns. What's different between them is that this bottom one is, is a really small unit that we only pick up on like one channel, uh, whereas these ones are, are kind of bigger units. They're picked up on more channels. So clearly big units on many channels are more robust to drift because the probe moves a little bit up and down and you know the unit is more or less on the same channels. But for a small unit that maybe you only see on one channel, the probe moves a little bit, and, and now all of a sudden it's on the next channel down, um, and it's a, it's a much bigger change in terms of the waveform itself. Or it might be even worse, it might move in between channels and then you kind of lose it completely and you can't even see it anymore. So, um, as I think we'll, we'll see, and hopefully we'll experience this on, on your own data, um, drift is gonna be much less of a problem for bigger units than small units. Of course, big and small is also always relative to your sampling grid, so just how far apart your electrodes are. And we'll, we'll, we'll see exactly how those two interact. Um, okay, so Jennifer has been, been doing these tests for us, so we've had this you know, kind of stable simulation for a while. That we, you know, we, we knew we'd do really well even in 
situations of, you know, like really high noise, like more than your noisiest recording, somehow the algorithm still can pull out on these flat simulations, can pull out the units very well. So it can't be about, you know, that, that kind of like noise of the recording. It, it, it has to be about things like this, non-stationarities non like this in time. And sure enough, if you build a simulation that has drift, uh, which in this case, uh, what Jennifer did is she took some of the, um, well, basically she made some, some oversampled simulations where she would have access to a high density waveform uh, and she would kind of simulate that this waveform is moving up and down according to a, a sinusoidal pattern uh, over, you know, 10, 20, 50 microns uh, worth of drift. And then sure enough, the algorithms are now performing pretty poorly. Okay, so we've identified a situation that, you know, we, we have the algorithms are not doing well. So now at least we have something to optimize, right? So now we can start um, testing how to, uh, to fix this problem. We, we, have a, we have a measure, we have a benchmark we're trying to optimize. So that's how kind of the Kilosor 2 was, was built to, to, to fix, um, to stabilize these neurons. Um, and I'm gonna step you through it, but you know, it's, it does really well on recordings with drift, well, with, with, with probably with this level of drift, maybe. Uh, maybe not, maybe we'll have to see kind of other cases you guys might have brought, brought with different types of drift. And, um, maybe longer recordings over days, um, questions of stability and, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, and yeah, well, also of course it, it still does well when the simulation is stable, actually even a little bit better because although the main thing we changed was, uh, was the drift correction part, uh, there's been, you know, there's been a lot of kind of under the hood small modifications that we think are, are, are helping overall. Um, and so it will be good to test those too, but I think the first thing we'll all be starting with is, is trying to quantify the drift in, in, in our recordings trying to get a sense of whether it's solved or not uh, and what we can do about that. Okay, so how does, how, what's the core of the algorithm now? So let's forget about drift correction for a moment. Um, here are a bunch of waveforms. Uh, they are just averaged out from some neurons, each one of them. You can see them over some 10 consecutive channels or so. Um, the main property we're going to use um, is that, you know, across channels, if you just look at one channel, and let's say these neurons were all living on the same channel, they, they weren't, but let's say that you had many neurons on one channel, it's pretty hard to tell them apart just based on the one channel. But as soon as you have even a little bit of more information extra on the sides, um, it's, you know, it, it's kind of a, it's the, a combinatorial problem, right? So that's where we're taking advantage of the fact that neurons have different shapes on different channels. Um, you know, all of these are, are very distinguishable from one another uh, due to their exact patterns of, of, of little wiggles and, and, and squiggles. You know, we don't understand how these patterns are necessarily formed in the extracellular space. We know there's some amount of variability between brain areas. Um, um, but really, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty lucky, right, that, that we get to use these kinds of signatures that, that have this kind of complex, rich information in their little squiggles to tell neurons apart. Otherwise, electrophysiology would just, you know, it would not, not be possible to, to really isolate single neurons um, from these kinds of extracellular probes. And so the way the Kilosort works, uh, which is a little different from the more classical algorithms before Kilosort is something we call template matching. It's uh, where we take templates like this, um, we put them into this, you know, we call these templates, you know, A is just a big matrix that corresponds to that template across channels and samples in time. Like, you know, let's say we have 60 samples for our spike temporally. Um, and so this equation, okay, this is the main equation that, that describes the model, really. And what this equation says is that we've recorded some data that's basically a big matrix. It has channels by time. Uh, it's one big array. And this matrix, we think, 
uh, to a good approximation can be described as the sum of all the neurons uh, in the extracellular space, well, all, all of the waveforms of these neurons. Um, and the waveform is always basically the same shape, except it might be scaled by some amplitude term x. Uh, and this amplitude term might, uh, will change from spike to spike. It might have a mean across the spikes from the same neuron. Um, might even have some, some neurons might have more variability of their spike amplitudes, some might have less variability. Um, but basically every spike will just look like a scaled up and down version of some prototypical spike that this neuron uh, is making all the time. And so that's, that's the approximation plus noise here. Um, and you can see in this problem, if, if I was to give you the voltage and let's say the templates, because you know what templates the neurons have, then you would actually be able to use these templates and scroll through the raw data uh, to find where these templates match the raw data. So you'd, you'd uh, scroll the template across that, that raw data we just looked at before. Hold on. Okay. We just scroll the templates across. Ignore that. All right, so we have our little template that's, you know, now we think of it as a little matrix instead of, of the, the wiggles. And we have the template uh, and we scroll it along the data at every single potential position, and we ask how well does it match that position. And if it matches well, then we've detected a spike from that neuron. So that problem on its own is not so difficult. Um, that's basically the template matching problem. However, we are not given these templates to begin with, uh, so we have to determine those two. And so, the way we're going to do this is we're going to observe that actually if I gave you the spike times, so these TKs here, so these are the spike time for spike K. If I give you the spike times from one neuron, then you have a, you know pretty well how you're going to get this waveform, average waveform, right? This is the template is just the average waveform. Um, and so both of those problems on their own are not so difficult. Uh, and so if we can just kind of alternate and kind of bootstrap our way in to optimize this model, so optimize the fit of this model on the right to the raw data on the left by alternating between optimizing A, well, AX and TK, um, then, then suddenly the problem becomes solvable. And we, we know we're making progress when you, we're kind of minimizing our cost function here. And the cost function being the discrepancy between the left side and the right side. That's essentially how the, the you know, kill sort one works. That's the, the basic aspect of the algorithm. It has some, you know, it has some tricks under the hood to, to make this problem faster um, and help a little bit with basically smoothing the templates. Uh, so we parameterize these waveforms. So these waveforms are channels by number of time points. You can imagine if you have lots of channels, then there's gonna be a lot of parameters to estimate there. And so we kind of, we, we want to be a little bit more robust to that. Um, and so we represent this waveform in a kind of a rank three basis, basically, where it only has kind of three spatial um, components and three temporal components. So this is, this is the same thing that you'd get if, let's say, you do PCA of some matrix A. Um, you would get the decomposition like this. I don't know if you can see that. And so what this looks like is it has three temporal components. So these three explain most of the variation of the spike across depth, right? So this spike, let's say, let's say this spike only had like every single channel looked like this, was just scaled up and down. So this is a, a rank one matrix, right? But then, you know, you'll have things like uh, maybe like the middle channel only kind of goes down and up, and then the next one over maybe goes up a little bit and then down. Um, and so, you know, maybe there's like some extra wiggle here, which happens, it's part of the complex signature of this spike. Um, well, then what we found is like, if we just keep something like three temporal components there, so, you know, we'll keep like the biggest one and some wiggle around it and, and you know, so on, uh, that tends to be enough to reconstruct even, 
very complex kind of spatiotemporal wave, uh, waves. And then it also gives us nicely some um, pattern of amplitudes of these um, PC waves over depth. And you know, usually it'll be something maybe like this, uh, kind of allowing us to clearly say where the, the, real, the real center of this waveform is. OK, so that helps with speed, and it helps with kind of denoising these uh, waveforms, especially as we're doing this optimization uh, continuously. Uh, based on you know batches of relatively small data, so um, as you'll see, because our you know our, some of the neurons are fire more, some fire less, uh, but as we're go going with the optimization, this template A will always represent something like the mean of the last you know 100, 200 spikes, something like that. So we take the mean of those past 200 spikes, we take the PCA of that, and and that's our best estimate of the current uh, template. Okay, so that model that I described to you, uh, the, the main thing it doesn't take into account is the fact that, you know, waveforms uh, from a single neuron are not stationary like this. They are going to move up and down on our recording device because of drift. And it's particularly easy to see drift if you have, like, uh, a big linear probe that has, you know, channels all across depth. Um, and then what happens then is if you have drift, you know, a neuron moves up and down, but you'll still pick it up on some channels further up. Whereas, you know, if you had something like tetrodes and it moves too much, you maybe lose it forever, you wouldn't know whether this neuron moved out of your recording area or whether it just went silent and it stopped firing for some reason. And so having more channels at least help you know the kind of problem you have. Um, even, you know, nowadays, even with tetrodes, we have a better way of quantifying drift, so we'll get to that. But the most basic plot you could make is you detect a whole bunch of spikes. These are just coming from kilosort one. You color every spike by their amplitudes. Um, and you can start kind of seeing these kinds of patterns of, you know, through the data going up and down. And you can use some kind of algorithm to draw lines through these patterns. To, and um, sure enough, these periods of drift were happening because this mouse was uh, running, head fixed on a treadmill. And so in every bout of running, the probe would move a little bit, um, which is one of the biggest challenges with drift and with having behaving animals, um, the fact that it tends to happen when your animal is behaving. So whether it's licking or running or I don't know, struggling or I don't know about sniffing, maybe sniffing too. Uh, that's, you know, for the most part, a lot of us here, we're, we're interested in behavior, uh, and so there's going to be some movement. And because, you know, the brain, you know, we can fix the cranium of this mouse or this animal as much as we can, but the brain is floating in a liquid. So any amount of, you know, momentum will result in some amount of movement. So we have to be extra careful. So this is what we'd call fast drift because it happens on relatively fast time scales, and we try to distinguish it from slow drift, such as um, you know, what might happen when you first insert an electrode and the tissue is relaxing, things are kind of moving a little bit, and you'll say, you know, maybe you wait half an hour and you're good, but really there's, there's still a significant component of slow drift over, over long time scales, uh, even with, if you wait. Um, and even in, in chronic recordings, it really depends on your preparation, and it really depends on your ability to tell whether you have that problem or not. And so I'll show you in a minute how you can t tell pretty well, we think. Uh, I would just, I would just say that, you know, we thought, I'm sorry. Originally, we thought that we're just going to, you know, now we can estimate drift pretty well. So we're just going to move these spikes up and down according to this drift and kind of undo the whole process. And then run a standard spike sorting algorithm on it, and everything will be fine. Turns out everything was not fine. Um, and so the reason it didn't work, OK, so estimation we thought maybe was pretty good, but really we didn't have a good way to know that it was working. Um, and eventually we realized we had a bit of a, of a chicken and egg problem to get um, the only way to like really 
be able to measure drift is to know that some neuron moved from one place to another. Um, and so it requires us to know which spikes are coming from which neuron. So that's actually the second situation, right? So to determine drift, we must have the right clustering already, which we don't have. And to have the right clustering, right, to be able to know that a spike, even though a spike has appears here now and it's moved a few channels up, now how do we know it's the same neuron? Well, you know, we would have to know what the drift was to be able to get the right clustering. And so we were hoping that, you know, I've just, I just described another chicken egg problem to you that we were able to solve, right? That iterative optimization of getting the templates and the spike times, you know, one based on the previous one and the previous one and the previous one. And so it turned out that that approach here didn't work. And the reason it didn't work um, was that a lot of the neurons, um, you know, here's a nice neuron that we see on a lot of channels. And so you might think, as this neuron you know, is moving up and down, it would be pretty easy to interpolate its waveform to know what the waveform would look like if you were to move, let's say, half a row up. So that's, that interpolation part of our, of our iterative you know, estimation of drift would have worked fine for this neuron, but not so much for these neurons. So you know, these spikes here, for example, this is mainly big on one channel. And so when this neuron moves down on the probe, it's going to start becoming big on these two channels. Um, and it's going to start becoming small on these channels. So then we'll, at some point, it will look like you know, three small waveforms, smaller versions of this waveform, all on these three channels. And that's simply not you know, a linear reconstruction of the original channels. Uh, and that's happened because our sampling grid right, is too coarse compared to the features that we're trying to you know, change over depth, the features we're trying to interpolate. Right? So we kind of, you know, we, we probably all know this, the NYQS theorem right, tells us that we have to sample the signal you know, at least as finely as the features that we're trying to measure. And so we, we can just linearly interpolate this waveform. We, won't, we wouldn't really even know what it would look like just based on this one snapshot if it moved down uh, half a row of channels. And the thing is, a lot of neurons look like that, right? So that's, that's really why um, things weren't working, because a lot of neurons are sampling, you know, our trade-offs of recording more neurons, so having channels more spread out, um, were kind of conflicting with our trade-off to have enough sampling to be able to see a spike as it's moving up and down. Um, and so eventually that really pushed us onto a different approach, a different kind of algorithm, where uh, we would do basically drift tracking without ever really estimating the drift. So we, we never draw those lines that you saw on the plots before. And this is a more general approach. Uh, all we're going to need to ask is um, basically, you know, we're going to assume, for now we're going to assume the waveforms are changing slowly in time. And so all that we need to know is that at least for some period of time, the waveform stays the same. And then this, the drift tracking problem turns, you know, the drift correction problem turns into a drift tracking problem, where as we're processing data batch by batch, you know, a batch maybe is like one or two seconds, we're processing data batch by batch. When every batch, we see the spike shape changed a little bit, because we are assuming there's only slow drift for now. On every batch, it only changed a little bit, so we just update our waveform uh, and keep going to the next batch. And because we're always kind of tracking the slow changes of these waveforms, we never have to know that this neuron is going up or down. We just have to know that the waveform is changing slowly, and then we can track it, and we can know it's from the same neuron. So that's, that, that's the basic idea, that we're going to do a tracking problem instead of a, of a depth estimation problem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Actually, the shape of the template is drifting. Yeah. How then do you know if that one template versus a template from other neurons? Right. So as long as they all drift together, they're gonna they're gonna tend to stay apart, right? So if you start with two neurons that have different waveforms, and uh, the probe moves, 
them both together up because it's you know the tissue is like that then they're both they're still going to stay separate so as long as we as the the shift is as long as the change is small right so imagine it okay here's the virtual axis of um, features and here's two clouds of like spikes and they're they're kind of let's say they're they're kind of going up like this let's say there's a bit more separation right and so as we're moving along, we, let's say we started correctly with two clusters. And as we're moving along, we're continuously updating the mean of this cluster as it's going. It's always a little bit be lagging behind, right? Um, but because the change at any one time point is small, then the mean of our cluster is mostly going to stay within the same cluster. Um, and so this is, you know, if there was a, here's a situation where that wouldn't work, which is, uh, if you've got your you know, slow changes and all of a sudden there's a big change and then there's a, another neuron back here, all of a sudden there's a big change. And so now you're tracking this, this guy you know, kind of slowly and now you just, you've shifted to another neuron and you thought, oh, this is the same neuron. Uh, and then you'll make maybe another one here, another one here. Okay, so that's, that's a situation that doesn't work when there's some amount of fast drift. And so we'll go to that case in one moment. Okay, and so template is always now a running average. So that's our, you know, it, we're not doing anything complicated in terms of tracking. It's always the running average of the previous n detected spikes. Um, it's annealed during optimization from 20 to 400. So this has to do with kind of when we're starting out, we're still kind of exploring and uh, we want our templates to change quickly, so it's only the average of a few spikes. And then during the optimization, as things stabilize, we want to get a cleaner average waveform, so we increase the number of average spikes to 400. And those are just parameters that one could change, but this general principle we find helps to start it small and go large. And if you're lucky enough that your recording only has slow drift, then it will give you things of this sort, where this neuron previously split into multiple clusters. Um, you know, you, at the beginning you can see it and it starts large and it goes down and then eventually it kind of crashes into the noise here. Uh, and that happens because this in fact is an example of a neuron that we only saw on one channel. And so it went in between channels and that's where we couldn't really track it anymore. We could probably dip a little bit more into there to get more spikes, but this is just one example. So here's more examples kind of overlaid of things that were only changing slowly. And because they're only changing slowly, that let us, you know, these are neurons from kind of a set of kind of consecutive channels. And by the way, these start to be, you know, phi uh, pictures from phi. So this is the visualization GUI that we use that you might be familiar with. And when you select a lot of neurons, you know, you, you see the waveforms, the average waveforms here over, you know, there, there's a lot of overlap between these. Um, there's something like, you know, 10 cells here and they all have like nice autocorrelograms. There's nothing in the middle here, no refractory violations or a little bit maybe. Uh, and then the cross correlograms, they're all kind of flat indicating that, you know, no neuron has been split into two pieces that would have to recombine. Um, so, it was already working pretty well like this on uh, recordings with slow drift. And so how do we deal with fast drift? And so the idea that uh, I had was that we are going to uh, basically try to rearrange, um, if we could just rearrange the data temporally such that nearby batches have similar patterns of spikes um, then that would essentially correspond to a, a reconfiguration according to drift. So if it happens that, you know, batch one, two, three, four, five of the recording have spikes that more or less match each other, they're probably from the same period. But if later on in the recording, you know, an hour has passed, and now all of a sudden we're still getting spikes that look like the beginning, well, those are probably coming from the same depth on the probe. And if there's some other spikes that really look very different, those are probably coming from a different depth on the probe. And the way we can quantify that is 
we split our data into these little chunks of time, I think by default two seconds long, and we compare every single little chunk of time to every other chunk of time, we expect spikes from it, like that, and we compute a batch-to-batch -batch distance. And this batch-to-batch -batch distance is, um, is, is, is essentially the product of doing a little clustering on the waveforms, um, getting something like for NeuroPixel probes, we get maybe like 100 prototypical templates for every little batch, and then we compare the similarity, the best matches between two batches in terms of, of templates, and we take the average of that minimum distance, and that gives us a batch-to-batch -batch distance, which is what we needed in order to resort batches. And this is a picture which, if you've used SkillSort 2, you know, kind of pops up during the, the processing. Uh, and this picture tells us that, you know, in this case, there were 1,800 batches. Each one of them, I guess, one or two seconds long. Let's say one second long, so maybe like half an hour in total. Um, and blue means that uh, it's, it's a low value, the batch to batch distance is low, and yellow means it's the batch to batch distance is high. So here in the beginning we had a little group, a little block of time points where things are relatively stable. Uh, and then all of these start to become pretty dissimilar from this next one over. And then they get a little bit similar again over here. And then there's you know, some more going back and forth, back and forth. And you know, you look by this, you can you can tell there's some kind of low dimensional structure to this matrix where you know maybe one set of time points kind of looks more like the beginning and another set of time points looks more like this later part. Uh, and sure enough, if we now use an algorithm to try to sort similar batches towards the beginning yeah, or towards the end, according to kind of a, smooth, a more smooth transition between them from top to bottom. Uh, then after simply shuffling the rows and columns of this matrix, we get this other matrix. And what you can notice about it is it's a lot more smooth along the diagonal. So as we're moving, so you know, these, now these numbers are completely kind of shuffled up and, and permuted. Um, you know, it doesn't go one, two, three, four, five, you know, it goes one, two, three, four, and then maybe 120, 920, you know, it's, it's completely permuted order. But the order is such that um, they have similar, they have more similar clusters of spikes in them, batches that are closer to each other. And you can tell that if you kind of look along the diagonal at, you know, basically there's no longer these sharp transitions at certain points along the matrix. And that's really what we're trying to avoid. We're trying to avoid sharp transitions because we know sharp transitions will prevent our tracking from going through. So as long as we know that there's only kind of smooth transitions like here, then it means we can apply this tracking approach and go through the batches and be confident that you know, in no batch are the waveforms gonna change so much that you know, it's gonna completely throw off our, our tracking, our, our, our waveform tracking method. So that's the basic idea between um, to, you know, we're, we're, again, we're not doing drift estimation here. At no, at no point are we estimating uh, what Z position we're at, because really we're only interested to know um, which batches look similar to each other. And if the changes are due to drift or due to something else, we also don't care, right? You could imagine like chronically, maybe you've implanted some electrode and the, the tissue quality changes or something that will result in some kind of slow changes too. And in principle, you could correct those as well with this approach. Okay, um, I'm not gonna, we can go into the algorithm if you want later. Basically there's, you still, this is, you know, a little problem of its own. How do you resort any matrix like this uh, to make it as smooth as possible on the diagonal? So there's, um, the algorithm that we have seems pretty robust to different cases, but it would be good to see what it looks like on your data. Here's a bunch more NeuroPixels recordings. Um, and these are, you know, same exact probe, right? Um, different animals, perhaps, uh, but same exact probe. And you can see kind of on the left for each one of these pairs, you can see the statistics 
of, of this batch to batch distance. And you can see that there's a, there's a lot of variability. Um, I pulled out mostly those that had fast drift. Um, and you can see the fast drift is, is kind of more or less resolved into slow drift. Blue along the diagonal, yellow outside. And so most of these are, are pretty good, they're pretty fine. Sometimes, even after reordering, some sharp transitions can remain, and we should be a little worried about those, right? What that means is that simply it might be a situation where there's been some abrupt drift and you've kind of never gone back to cover the space between two positions. And so with all the reordering that you might have, right, so like you have maybe drift like this, and then there's a bigger drift and goes like that, you know, you're, you're never covering the positions in the middle. So if you rewarded this correctly, it will go like this, and then big drift, and then it will go like that. Um, so that's the situation where this approach would, would break and would fail. And so that's one of the ways you can diagnose from the, one of the figures that Kilosort is giving you whether it's going to work or not. Um, these are, you know, and even if, um, right, so sometimes there is no fast drift, which we can see in these ones, right? So this started already pretty smooth along the diagonal. And after resorting, you know, not much really happened because they were pretty smooth to begin with. There was no, no fast um, transition. Uh, and, you know, this gives us a way to estimate that that happened. And we can be a lot more confident in these recordings that maybe they're going to sort pretty well because at least we don't have, you know, super fast drift. And so when this works correctly, it allows us to track neurons like this that are changing their amplitude, you know, all the time. Um, where we're tracking, you know, this is a principal component feature here. The neuron is small, has a small waveform, um, but there's, there's very little contamination, and we're tracking it throughout uh, successfully. There's another one, um, smaller things, but you, know, you can start looking at, so these are two principal component coefficients from different channels. Only spikes from this one neuron here, uh, but you can see pretty clearly how this neuron starts big, so, and this is a scatter plot of these two channels waveforms, waveform features. So you can see how this neuron starts big on this feature, uh, and then this cloud goes down to a situation where it's big on this other feature, but not on the first feature. So these are the kinds of, of, of situations where, um, you know, if you do a, a more standard clustering method, uh, it would have trouble fitting something to this, this cloud of points, especially, you know, the more curved it is. Here's um, another one. You can kind of still see, it, like, these kinds of features in the cross PC feature space, just, just to give us more ways of um, estimating what kind of, of drift we're looking at. And you can look at the amplitude. In most cases, the amplitude is, is pretty self-explanatory. You can, you can tell what's going on just by looking at that. Here's another neuron. This one, if you look in, in the cross feature map, you see this kind of you know, big V shape. So that would be, you know, for any kind of algorithm that's clustering algorithm look, looking just for Gaussian shapes, that would be a, a pretty bad, uh, difficult thing to track. Is another V-shape like that. Um, but of course, we're never seeing these V-shaped features. Our features are always nicely stable and constant because we're always looking at time points where the neuron really looked similar because it was at the same position. Uh, so at any one position along this sorting, well, after we reshuffle the time points, at any one position, we can apply our classical algorithm that just assumes everything is nice and perfect, because it is just for that short period of time. And if you, um, another kind of approach that, that people have taken to, to deal with these kinds of, of problems, particularly with like, you know, weird shapes in your cluster feature plots, um, are to kind of Basically, if you have, if you have nonlinear shapes in your cluster plots, then you need to use a nonlinear clustering algorithm, something that's not just going to have linear boundaries between two classes, right? So the, the blue and the red here cannot be split just according to a single line, which is what 
a normal you know, k-means Gaussian mixture model would do. Uh, and so people have developed kind of complicated nonlinear algorithms to be able to, to track these features. But what all of these methods uh, are missing about our spike data in the first place is the time axis. So if you're just trying to cluster based on some feature space, you have lost information about when in time each of these spikes has come from. Um, and that's the information that, that really simplifies the problem in the first place. And so if you have two neurons like this, you know, the blue and the red here, uh, and ignore the fact that we lose the red for a while. That's not what I'm trying to show. I'm trying to show the blue and the red here in the beginning. You can see how similar their feature space projections are. They come really close to each other across time. Um, they have very similar features. You can see them here on the right, right? So the blue has maybe this little blip here that the red does not have. Um, and so the only reason we can really separate these neurons even for this period of time here is that at any one time, they are distinct waveforms. They're moving up and down together. So kind of like this, if we were to average over time their features, you know, the clouds of points you know, if we average these two clouds over time, there would be a lot of overlap between them that we would have no way of dealing with. But at any one moment in time, the clouds are very separate. So if our clustering problem is well defined at any one time point and we can, we can track it, then we get more information than if we were forgetting where the spike is coming from in time. Does it make sense about the, this, this point about isolation? So the, basically, it increases our isolation distance. Um, so if the isolation here, you know, like the D prime between these two distributions, you know, might be like two or something, uh, at any one time the D prime here is, you know, something like 10 or whatever, some larger number. And so by tracking things through time, we can keep them separate uh, that we wouldn't if we were uh, collapsing across time. Okay, so that's, that's the basic, you know, hard part about the algorithm. I think I've basically described um, uh, its, 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 its biggest change essentially from kilosort to one, right? So if we can reduce this problem uh, to, from fast drift to slow drift, and from slow drift to tracking the templates and then using kilosort one as an algorithm, that's, those are, that's basically the simplification we've done. So I call this model-free tracking because we never build the model of the exact position of the channels in tissue and how those might change. Um, okay, there are some, um, basically these other smaller changes that I mentioned that have nowhere near as much of an impact as the drift correction has, um, have to do with basically solving local minima of this optimization problem. So basically, if you start with poor templates to begin with, for example, uh, you might get stuck so you in a, in a local mode, right? So if your initial guesses at what the neurons might look like are bad, um, and you just apply this iterative optimization blindly, um, then they're gonna stay bad, basically. They can't really escape the local minima because this is not a you know, nicely behaved convex optimization problem. This is a, a, a kind of clustering problem that we assign uh, labels to each spike um, discreetly. And so what can we do to address this local minima? Well, one of the things is, one of the things that might happen, right, if you start with the wrong set of templates and they're kind of mostly, you know, maybe they pick up some spikes over there, but they stay mostly in the place where you initialize them and you miss the fact that there was always some other kind of more weird shape that you didn't have in your initial set of guesses. And so what we do along the optimization is we add missing neurons. So as we're going along, um, okay, I'm gonna go through each one of these actually in a bit more detail. We add missing neurons, we drop templates that might be copies of each other's, so they're, they're redundant, and we split over merged uh, clusters. So clusters that really contain two neurons, but they're very similar. Uh, we, we test them and we split them if necessary. Yeah. 
you do that in a cross-validated way, or is nope. that not necessary? Um, we can talk about, so cross-validation, right, would, um, is, is a statistical procedure to try to tell how well our model is explaining the data, right? So we could say, uh, let's see how well the right-hand side explained the left-hand side, and then maybe we could apply it on some test data to get a measure of that. Um, but the thing is, at no, but that's still not an interpretable measure of how well we're doing, right? It's this cost function in itself is, is you know, let's say it's, it's a 1.2 that doesn't really tell us how well we're doing. So we're gonna want some kind of more refined measures, well, not refined, just more interpretable measures of how well we're doing. Uh, and it's gonna be part of like the spike, you know, the cluster isolation metrics that we have to think about um, when we, when we don't have ground truth, right, we don't know what the neurons are supposed, which ones are supposed to be from the same neuron, but we still want an estimate of how well we're doing, then we have to design these kind of metrics. Those will happen usually in a kind of a decoupled step after, after the algorithm is run. Um, as far as this cost function go, left minus right hand side, we just want to make sure it's going down, because that way we know that our optimization is optimizing something correctly. But it might help maybe with the local minimum. Yeah, that's, that is a good, um, um, good idea. In a sense, every new batch that we take is kind of like test data because we fit the templates on all the batches before it, and now we're applying them on this batch. Um, and so the actual thing that happens um, with, this, with this tracking uh, is we go through the data once from end to end to first find the templates, uh, and then we go kind of backwards uh, to use, you know, we fix now the number of neurons, and we fix the number of neurons, really. So during this forward pass, we allow neurons to come in because we're adding missing ones. We allow neurons to be split or dropped or so on. This is all in the, what we call the optimization pass. Uh, and then there's the tracking pass, or like the final extraction pass, uh, where we're no longer going to do any of these steps. Um, we're gonna, st whatever set of neurons we arrived at, arrived at um, we're gonna go with those. We're just going to allow them to track, still track the data. Um, and th those are gonna correspond to the final spike times that you see for these neurons. Um, so yeah, by default at least, Every data batch is only seen once during the optimization. And that tends to be enough in most cases, just because we're really not limited by the optimization so much as we're limited by the changes that can happen uh, over time. Okay. Uh, I mean, I don't know, you guys have more questions about the, the drift correction part? Because I don't think we're gonna come back to it other than in actual practical usage. Right, so some spikes were very clearly missed, and that's particularly easy to see if you like look at the traces. Well, this is just some figures from an email that I know I got. Some guy, well, Maxime, you know, I know Maxime. Um, he emails me and he says, you know, I'm upset because most of my spikes are being missed, and I'm pretty sure there's some spikes here, and they're just not colored, so therefore they're not part of Kilosort's set. And so, um, the sub eventually, the solution we arrived at um, was that, you know, we, we have this model basically of the raw data, and it's a generative model, which means that every time we do identify a spike with our template matching, actually I've skipped a very important part, every single time we identify a spike, we actually subtract that spike off from the raw data. We peel it off, because we have a model of it. We know that it's this average waveform multiply by some um, amplitude value. And so we have a model of it, we subtract it off from the raw data, and so if the model is good, then what is left should be just kind of flat, maybe noisy lines, right? Um, but in fact, one thing that is left is other, other neurons that might have had overlapping spikes at the same time. And so if we can do this well, and that's the advantage of template matching methods, if we can do this well, you know, we can subtract off. So here's the original. Here's with some of the templates subtracted off. You can see they almost completely disappeared, right? Like this guy here 
wait, no, this spike is still there, but this one is not, right? This one's disappeared, this one's disappeared. You know, a lot of these spikes that we can see by eye, like these little like black, black dips followed by kind of white rebounds, um, we were able to well subtract them off. And the reason why that's important is that you might have little clusters like this of three spikes that have at least some parts of them overlapping each other. And so if we can go with a template subtraction step, subtract off one, and then it doesn't affect the detection of the other ones. And then we come back, we subtract another one and another one. Um, and as long as these two spikes are not like overlapping too much, right, then we can, we can do this pretty well. You might imagine a weird situation where two spikes by chance are happening exactly at the same time, so they kind of accumulate and sum up to each other so that they look as a, like a third spike, right? For that. that makes it pretty hard, you know, it's a rare situation, but that's kind of one of the issues you might encounter where, you know, the algorithm might be fooled to think, oh, you know what, this might be a third neuron that has its waveform be the sum of these two. That's rare, but it depends on the kinds of data you have. The more synchronous spikes you might have, the more this could be a problem. Okay, good. So, right. So now that we know that we can subtract off spikes, then we can see anything that's left. And if there's something left that's kind of big, just in the sense that it has some you know, big amplitude or at least one or a few channels consecutively, then we can hypothesize that that could be a good candidate to add to the algorithm. So we introduce those missed spikes as templates. Um, and then we are going to basically triage these templates because there's gonna be a whole lot of false positives here, right? Like if, if we interpret every single blip here as a spike, then you know, we're gonna have thousands and thousands of, of clusters and they're all gonna have exactly one waveform, you know, the one where we found it. And so what we test is we test if one of these new templates, if it gets picked up again, at least a few more times, then we know it's probably from a neuron. Because it's, it's unlikely you'll see the same pattern of noise, you know, more than once, really, uh, if you have enough channels. Okay, and so we're gonna triage these aggressively and often, uh, and that's really what allows us to, to grab more and more of the, of the spikes. Um, uh, and Kyoso is pretty good now at finding um, good spikes, you know, even close to the noise floor. Okay. Okay, I say this is a new problem, which it was at some point, but it's no longer a problem. Um, yeah, let's not worry about it. Basically, I had to, in the original KiloSort 1 algorithm, we had to do some approximations to get the algorithm to work uh, because, you know, the GPUs were not fast enough back then to do this quickly. Um, so with the kind of, you know, newer, better GPUs, they run faster. There's been optimizations in the code itself. So now we can kind of, what I've described to you so far is now accurately the way in which we do this optimization. Um, you know, previously it was more like a bit of an ideal uh, and we're working out ways to achieve that. But now actually this full model uh, is implemented uh, on, on GPUs. And of course you probably already all know with these kinds of big data sets, um, you really want to be running these algorithms on the GPU to be fast enough that you don't have to wait forever uh, for it to, to complete. And we do have GPUs for you on the cluster when you request a node, and we'll show you how to uh, request those GPUs. All right, so that was one of the kind of smaller modifications that we did to KiloSort 1. Uh, the other smaller modification is just some refinement of our strategy to drop templates. Um, and I put up here these template projections that you might not have heard about before because you're used to thinking of uh, feature projections of your spikes. So you're used to thinking maybe that you're doing PCA of your spikes and you get some features and looking at feature space. Well, instead of that feature space, the space we're looking at now um, is basically taking the template from one neuron, the template from another neuron, and we project the spikes from all both of these neurons into these two templates, literally just project them, like linear projection, linear summation. Um, and that shows us, you know, clouds of points, the red ones coming from template two, the blue ones coming from template one. And you can see in this case, 
there's kind of no boundary between them really. This, this sharp line here is in fact kind of artifactually the way that the algorithm has cut this cluster. And so if we can identify that there's some continuous distribution between these two templates and it's not, there's not a big space in between them, uh, then we can know that these could be safely merged together. And that's how that decision is reached uh, during the optimization. And as a visualization in Phi, you also get this whenever you're trying to compare two neurons. Um, because it's, it's basically a way to use all the features of these two neurons, right? So not just the, the PC features of the spikes, but precisely the features that one neuron has versus precisely the features that another neuron has. Um, this is similar if you've heard to like linear discriminants. Uh, this is essentially projecting along the dimension of kind of basically the dimension between the centroids of these two uh, clouds of points. Okay, let's see. These are more, these are more details. Um, let's not worry too much about them. Uh, you have to worry a little bit about kind of the shapes of these clouds in this two-dimensional projection. But because we're in a two-dimensional space, you know, we're not in high-dimensional space, a thousand dimensions, uh, there's a lot more things we can do to, to really you know, estimate, should we expect some amount of variability because there's amplitude variability? Um, how big should this gap be? Uh, distributions by modal, things of that sort. All of that is pretty easy in two dimensions. It would be very hard on the original data uh, in very many dimensions. Right, so this is the same thing I was saying, you know, but now with respect to the problem of splitting clusters. Uh, so if you start with a cluster that has spikes from two neurons, how can you tell and separate them apart? Um, this is another one, a problem that's easy in one dimensions and hard in, in high dimensions. Um, in one dimension, you're just trying to see if your distribution, right, is bimodal, if it has any amount of bimodal structure to it. So if only we could reduce our high dimensional problem to a 1D problem, wouldn't that be great? So if we can find even one direction in high dimensional space along which the distribution looks bimodal, that's good enough evidence that, that they're separate clusters because we found one direction along which we can, we can cut uh, and they'll be separate. And so that's the basis for this algorithm. Uh, some of these clusters have more spikes than others, so that's why the histograms look different. Uh, but basically, it's an algorithm that, uh, it's, a, it's a projection pursuit algorithm, um, similar to things like independent components analysis, if you've heard about it, uh, where you're trying to maximize sparseness in those algorithms. But in our case, we're maximizing bimodality. So how well two Gaussian distributions fit to this projection. Uh, that's the, the direction the algorithm pursues. Let's see, okay, so of course, the, the more precision we have, the more we can separate neurons apart at lower and lower amplitudes. Um, and so we are, you know, in a pretty good position now, at least with some of these data sets with neuropixels, with, with this density of sites. Um, here are a whole lot of, of units coming from these same sites, uh, and there's enough differences between these units uh, that, again, we can, we can separate them nicely. Here's another one. Um, just, just more of these. Here's another one. Um, and you can look at these yourself later, or you know, you've probably looked at plots like this on your data already. Um, you get a sense of what we're looking for all the time is we want neurons to have a refractory period of their own. This one is maybe a little bit contaminated there. This one as well. But we want them to have a refractory period of their own and not have a refractory period with another neuron. This is like one of the main measures we have that, that we're really doing well. We're not splitting them too much. We're not over splitting them too much and we're not over merging them too much. If we were over merging too much, we'd see more contamination here. If we're over splitting them too much, we'd see refractory periods in one of the white plots, basically. So those are the, the, the two, two criteria. Okay, and I should say that these two criteria, um, 
form the basis of, there's just a whole lot more. Uh, these are actually all even on like the same site, all together. And you know, a lot of them get noisier and noisier, but that's a lot of them on the same site. Um, and it still doesn't look too bad. Okay, I was going to get to, I don't, I think that's just more, more examples. Okay, so one of the first things we did is we did comparisons with Kilosort 1. Um, now you've, you've seen one of our later comparisons on, on Jennifer's simulated drifted data set. Uh, but this is more a comparisons that, that we can do if we don't have access to ground truth data, which in our recordings, you know, we don't basically, um, except for a, a few, you know, neurons all around the world that people have done heroic experiments to collect ground truth for. And so in such a case, what might we look at? Um, well, so here's the situation that we have. In Kilosort 1, we have got um, all of these little clusters that are in different colors uh, that represent splits of the same neuron across multiple original clusters. And if you were using Kilosort 1, you have had to merge these manually yourself. If you're using Kilosort 2, they come to you already nicely separated. Um, what, you know, the other, this is, this is an example of this first thing I gave here, basically, where across time, eventually the first neuron drifts and becomes similar to the second neuron at the very beginning. Um, so that's where, you know, the problem of this, this strategy of, of drift tracking becomes particularly useful. You can see there's always a little white space in between here. Right? And, and that's how we know that, that we can separate these two neurons in the first place. Again, they have pretty similar waveforms. And so they're not separated um, in, a, in a single stable space of principal component features. There's overlap here. Uh, but if you have time-varying templates, then you can kind of separate them along this line. You can start quantifying how many good units you get out of either one of these algorithms. And you might do that by looking at things like autocorrelograms. Here's one unit versus another unit. Uh, so this is a good one because there's, it's flat between the units, but every unit has its own refractory period. So the same two neurons from before. Here's the population average of the autocorrelograms. It dips down to, to near zero here. The cross correlogram also doesn't have a lot of stuff, maybe a little bit of synchrony here, but maybe that's real. And then you can see how many units pass quality checks based on you know, having a good ACG and having no big CCG um, dip with another neuron. And if it passes those two quality checks, I think, maybe a firing rate check too, then it gets counted here um, and so there's something like two times more units found this way with Kilosor 2 and maybe like three times more spikes in total from these units. So it's not just that we can find more neurons, but we can also find more of the spikes from these neurons, right? Which can be completion of the spikes from a neuron can be pretty important because you don't want to always be losing neurons from a spike, sp spikes from a neuron, when this neuron is like, you know, drifting up or down with your probe. If it's drifting because of behavior, because the animal is licking, and so it's moved, you don't want to always be missing those. That's when you'll be making incorrect conclusions that, you know, maybe this neuron is tuned to licking because it, I can't see it anymore when the animal is licking. It's not active. All right, so what problems are left? Well, there's a few things. Um, you can see this red neuron here, um, right, both the red and the blue, in fact, are kind of lost between sites. Okay, actually, red was not a good neuron to begin with. So red has a, an autocorrelogram that doesn't have a dip. So this is just kind of the multi-unit noise at the, at the floor, noise of our recording. Blue is the actual neuron we're trying to track. And, you know, it, it's not that small. You can still kind of, kind of see it on these two a little bit here. But then it kind of goes and drifts into the, into the noise floor. 
And so that becomes the case because, you know, as it moves in between sites, it becomes too small on all these sites to be picked up. Okay, and so that's, that's one problem, and it's unclear if we can solve that problem at all, uh, although we do have an adaptive threshold that we can set here so that maybe we can accept more false positives if it means we'll get all the spikes from this neuron. And that's kind of a parameter you can, in principle, change yourself if you know, if you know what you're doing, if, if, if a lot of your neurons are dipping into the noise floor uh, or below the noise floor. And then here's another situation where what has happened here? Um, well, this is, I guess, just another neuron that kind of pops up from below the noise floor. Uh, so the red one we can track throughout, but the blue has just appeared here. Okay. More examples like this. Um, now, what's happening here? Again, the blue dips into the noise floor. There's something going on with the red over here that might be good to investigate further. Now, notice that, you know, in a lot of these plots, you'll start seeing things that look bimodal, that are averaged over time, that you might have thought, you know, if you didn't know that the neuron has changed its space, shape over time, and it was always kind of, let's say, going between up and down, up and down, you might see a bimodal distribution of features. You might think, oh, this is two neurons, but really it's the same one, it's just changing its shape uh, over time. And so that's something to be aware of, and you know, it's, it's, it's always possible that there are really two neurons, but it's also equally possible that it's just one that has been correctly tracked. Um, right. Um, sometimes the rearranged drift plot is a little weird, like this one that kind of looks circular, which it shouldn't. So like, you know, these batches here are dissimilar to the ones in the middle, but then they're similar to the ones at the end again and here as well, like almost like, you know, you drift too much up and then you come back at the bottom somehow. So that's inconsistent with, with just drift. There's got to be some kind of other change going on in there. We can still, I should also say, right, that's fine in the sense that as long as there's no big jump anywhere in here, we can, you know, we can in principle still do the, the tracking. We can still go through batches one by one. And as long as nothing changes too quickly, we'll be able to make it through to the other side. Uh, what really is hard is, um, and not fine, is when we have big discontinuities even after resorting. So those are the kinds of, of problems that take a lot more work to deal with. Or like this. Okay, so what are some of the main uh, parameters? I think we're getting close to the end of my slides here. Um, these are maybe like the first things that you guys are going to see, you guys see when you load up uh, the Kilosory GUI in MATLAB. And some of the first things to, to, to try changing. So I'm going to go through them, give you a sense of how they're supposed to work. Um, this threshold parameter that has a default of 12, uh, which is relatively large, is on the large side of thresholding, being a bit more conservative. Um, this is in fact, okay, this is in fact now has two values, so, but let's talk about the main one uh, that's used during optimization. Um, it's a threshold on the feature projection. So it's not a threshold in millivolts or something like that on spike amplitudes because we're never thresholding spike amplitudes. We're never finding spikes by looking at, at big spike amplitudes. We're always finding spikes by verifying the match of our templates to the raw data. And this way, we can use a lot of information from all of the different channels, not just the one with the biggest spike, um, biggest deflection, but we're using information from all channels, we're integrating it, uh, and now we're in a different space, this dot product space between our template and the raw data. And so it's in this dot product space that we want projections to be really high, because that means we found that spike. Uh, and it's in that space that we threshold these feature projections. That's the first thing to keep in mind. And in fact, we use a different threshold on the first forward pass uh, than we use on the final extraction pass. So why is that? Um, well, on the optimization pass, we don't care about getting every last spike from every neuron. We're just optimizing our templates here. Uh, 
So we want our templates to be as good as possible. So we threshold the spikes relatively high to get good templates. But now on the second pass, when we're, we're, we're happy with our templates, because that's all we've got, um, we have our templates. Now we want from this templates every last spike from that neuron. So we reduce the threshold a lot. Um, and then we estimate basically something like the distribution of amplitudes of this neuron. And if we see that it kind of the distribution of amplitudes um, is, you know, and something like, right? So we, we have our, our amplitudes in this feature space. Our original threshold was two, zero is here. We lower it to four. And we do that just to let everything in, right? So kind of on, the, on this pass, we're going to let in including some noise. Uh, but then what we're going to do at the end is we're going to look and see you know, if it's a nice spike that has a big amplitude. Um, then we can identify you know, where exactly that comes back to 0, and we can set its threshold here. Uh, if it's another spike that kind of goes like this, but then maybe you, we start seeing another kind of up ramp because we're starting to get some noise samples, uh, then what we have to do is kind of you know, decide where the, this dip is, where our best threshold would be to best separate this neuron from the noise background, from the multi-unit activity. Uh, and so this is done on a, basically this is an adaptive threshold that we set, neuron by neuron. So first we let, for every neuron, we let a lot of samples through, but then we decide where we should have drawn the threshold for every single neuron so that we can, you know, at the same time we can have these neurons that need very low thresholds um, and they'll be a little contaminated with the noise here perhaps, right? Uh, and we can have these like much bigger ones that, that are fine, we don't really have to worry about them, can even set a very high threshold and then they have very high isolation. Is this the same between those of one and two? No, it's not. Uh, what is the same is the way the thresholds work on the feature projections, on the, not feature, on the template projections. So that works in the same way, uh, but it used to be one fixed threshold for the optimization pass, one fixed threshold for the extraction pass, and that actually is the same, but it doesn't have this last step where we adaptively set thresholds for every neuron, which, which turned out to be pretty important. It actually fixes some of these you know, a lot of these examples that are shown are actually a little old, you know, where you can see the neurons, kind, the spikes kind of getting thresholded, right? So what I'm, saying, what I'm seeing here, right, that this very straight line can't be due to normal biological variability, right? That's, that's just where we set the threshold, that that's where they stop because of that. Um, so now with the adaptive thresholds, actually, that allows us to kind of track things a little bit further down. Um, adaptively neuron by neuron. Okay, there's one more threshold that can be adjusted, well, two more, that can be adjusted directly in the GUI. Um, this, is, this has always been called lambda because it's a term in our cost function um, that, that's a penalty on the amplitude distributions. So basically, we want our, remember we are allowing every spike to be multiplied by some value. So the waveform from a neuron can be multiplied by some value to create every single spike. Uh, and the question is, how much amplitude variability should we allow? If we allow too much variability, right, it might pick up you know, another neuron that's similar to this one but has smaller spikes, and we don't want that. Uh, and so that penalty is um, basically that relative penalty contribution to the cost function uh, is this term lambda. So the higher you set it, the more you're enforcing penalty, uh, amplitudes to be close to their mean. So higher means you'll have less amplitude variability. Um, this is the threshold that we use to split. I'm not sure what the default value is now. I think it's actually quite a bit lower, like 0.9. It's a threshold that we use in the final splitting step. So this is again something you'll see at the command line at the very end, there's a splitting step where it says, you know, I'm splitting clusters. It uses that algorithm I told you that, it's, that looks for bimodal distributions. And so to tell if something is bimodal, basically you fit two Gaussians to it, 
right? And you ask how much overlap is there between these two Gaussians. And if there's very little overlap, that means there, you know, the isolation between these two is near one because there's almost all of the spikes would be kind of correctly assigned to one cluster or the other. So you want to be close to one um, in order to split. So anything that's above some threshold will get split. Uh, this one is not exposed in the GUI, but it's again something you can change. Um, this happens, this is part of the merging step that I've described. So again, you can be more or less permissive as far as merges go. Um, it, I should say, you know, a lot of these things, um, their default values work, tend to work pretty well in a lot of cases. Um, it might be that you have different kind of data. Uh, in that case, you know, you're not gonna be changing every one of these parameters for every single data set you have. It's just that your, your statistics are different. So as long as you can identify even on one data set, what seems like a good set of parameters, they will tend to work well on the other data sets too because you know, your statistics are different from ours, but they're, they're consistent within your experiments. Okay, I had some conclusions here. Um, okay, so we have optimizations that I told you about to scale to very many channels. Uh, this requires some optimization you don't have to worry about yourselves. We're able to run this fully integrated model. Um, we uh, are able to do drift tracking for slow drift and we convert fast to slow. We detect the spikes that we missed. This also lets us actually find like really low firing neurons that you might see very rarely. Uh, that would be pretty hard to pick up otherwise. But because every time, you know, as we go through our batches, if we've extracted all of the neurons in our active set and there was something big, even on one batch, we're gonna consider that in our active set. All right, and then these things that I described at the end that I'm not gonna read out again, just all sorts of strategies that we have to, uh, to kind of avoid local minima during clustering. Okay, that's, that's all the you know, theory that I had prepared for you.